Welcome everyone, hi. Uh, my name is Mara Gittleman. I am one of the workshop and education coordinators at NYC Parks Green Thumb. We are the part of the New York City Parks Department that works with community gardens across the city. And we're so excited to be here today for the Green Thumb Grow Together Conference for the highs and lows of high and low tunnels workshop with Claudia Navas and Zachary Strine for, um, to, who will talk us through uh season extension methods followed by Vipin Bharathan who will show us a tried and true DIY design of his um that he's used in community gardens and so I'm excited to introduce Claudia Navas who is the project manager at Farm School NYC she has a background in community education outreach and program management She's currently contributing to Deep Roots, an Afro-Indigenous culinary curriculum that aims to highlight Black and Indigenous people's food ways. And Zach is the gardener, garden manager at the Wyckoff House Museum. Wyckoff House Museum builds cultural and agricultural connections within their community through innovative educational and farm-based programs. Thank you so much. You two have the mic. Thanks so much, Mara, and all involved in putting this conference together and um, for inviting us to do this workshop. Um, thank you everyone for joining also, and thanks to Zach too for being here. Um, please settle in. I'm a little sad that we are not in person for this, but we're gonna make the most of our hour together. Um, and also just please stay tuned to the next workshop with Vipin. I'm gonna share <clears throat> the agenda in the chat. I'll just, you sit there so you have an idea of what to expect from us. Um, to introduce this topic, um, growing under protected cover includes a wide variety of structures, uh, some that you can make yourself out of repurposed materials or ones that you can purchase a kit for and includes everything that you'll need. Um, some that are small, like for a single plant, or for a raised bed with several plants, some that are big enough to fit a tractor through, uh, and finally, some that are covered in different types of materials like hard or soft plastic, glass, or even materials like uh, mesh or jute. Um, so Mara, it'd be great if you could start the slides now. Thank you. Um, so just taking a little step back, I'm going to give a very brief history of growing under protected cover, um, which is a growing method that has been used for centuries. Uh, the earliest food production under protected cover was possibly growing of off-season cucumbers for the Roman emperor during the first century using a mobile cart on wheels covered in oil cloth that they would bring out to sit in the sun all day and then bring back in. Um, glass greenhouses were developed and used as early as the 5th century BC by Greeks. Uh, first evidence of use of heated greenhouses were possibly uh, in Korea in the 1400s. Then later in the 1800s in France, we started to see cloches or glass bell jars. So just smaller variations of these um, protected covers which you can see a picture of the first photo. That's a whole field of glass bell jars. Um, glass greenhouses were used, but glass was very expensive, so, and still is. Um, so this structure was generally reserved for the very wealthy only. Um, and basically these technologies remained unchanged until about 1939 with the creation of the plastic polyethylene, um, and then very gradually until the 1960s, this plastic film became a lot more available and we start to see these bigger structures covered with plastic that are what we now know as high tunnels. Um, we also start to see some other materials in other parts of the world, like in India, there's a photo on the bottom right uh, where they use jute walls and a plastic roof and jute in case you don't know is um it's a fibrous material think of like burlap or sisal twine that you might tie up tomatoes with um, 
In Japan, we see some low structures using straw mats and oil cloth. Um, other materials include mesh, like I mentioned earlier, used for shade, and in recent times, more uh, DIY, like these plastic bottles that you see on the bottom left, um, cut in half and placed over each plant, similar to like bell jars, but um, repurposing materials or this larger um, water tank, or even baskets in some cultures. Um, but what is it all for? Why would you want to use these structures and these different materials for growing? Uh, and I'd love to hear from all of you. So if you would please use the chat and share why you would want to grow under protected cover and please be as specific as you, as you can. And I'll wait to hear from some of you uh, as we move on to the next slide. Yeah, so some people shared to lengthen your growing season, of course. Um, you can grow all year round or even maybe three seasons um, to control the temperature, to get a head start on crops, exactly. Uh, so you have food for more times of the year, um, to preserve moisture, pest prevention. Yes, that's um, definitely something to consider with, uh, season extension using these protected covers is to protect from pests. At the same time, there's some challenges because you might um, breed some specific pests that really like that warm climate. Um, to start seeds, awesome. Yeah, please keep sharing. Um, I will share some other examples that maybe haven't been mentioned like, um, well, I mean, this is kind of implied, but to have hyper local food, uh, so really close to you year round um, to grow some heat loving crops also and culturally relevant crops that you might not be able to find in colder climates or grow in colder climates. Um, but thank you all for sharing and please keep sharing. Um, but now I'll talk sp more specifically about low tunnels. Um, this slide shows a couple of examples of low tunnels and a cold frame. So both of these can go over a raised bed or can be used when growing in the ground. Um, both are flexible and mobile in that you can put them on and then take them off when you're not using them. In other words, they're not permanent. Uh, low tunnels are generally made of wire hoops or metal or plastic pipes uh, with a plastic covering. So commonly this polyethylene because it's UV resistant um, it protects the plastic from the sun breaking it down. Um, and you can also use row covers. So maybe a show of hands if you use row covers. And I'm sorry, I can't actually see you. So <laughs> hoping everyone else can see these hands. Um, so row covers is the same concept, uh, except they use a, a light fabric to protect the plants. And this fabric is actually made of plastic also. Um, but on the bottom left here in this picture is a cold frame. So it's a slightly different, um, different look. Uh, it's made of wood and it's topped with either glass or hard clear plastic. And it's at an angle to maximize the sun's rays. Uh, it's essentially a miniature greenhouse. Um, these examples though, you can very likely make yourself uh, using repurposed materials. And thankfully the next workshop will actually talk more about these, about different kinds of low tunnels. Um, but in the next slide, yeah, um, are high tunnels. And as the name suggests, they're larger, taller structures. High tunnels generally are also covered in polyethylene. Um, they have, these hoops that are much, much stronger and durable. Um, they have additional materials to anchor the structure down, to secure against the wind, to provide support in the snow. Um, there are, as you can imagine, more construction um, than the low tunnels and more pieces to consider 
Um, you can grow directly in the ground if you're using a high tunnel or in raised beds like in the picture. You can even put low tunnels in a high tunnel um, like in the photo to provide that additional warmth. Um, high tunnels are generally passive heat, which means that it's just the structure itself and the sun that generates the, the warm climate inside. Um, they are sometimes called caterpillar tunnels or hoop houses, poly tunnels, poly houses. There's lots of names for them, um, but no need to get overwhelmed about all these different terms. Just know that there are lots of different types of protected cover and that each one can be modified to fit your needs, your budget, how much time you have, um, and your site. The photo on the left is more of what we'd call a greenhouse. So this is, they tend to be more permanent. Um, you probably would have an energy source for heating. Um, you can cover them with uh, a hard, clear plastic or glass. Um, they have doors. Um, so they're a little bit more technical also in that they have uh, fans for ventilation or lighting. They can be automated. Um, so as you can imagine, this will probably come with a higher cost also. And I'm gonna turn it over to Zach, who will talk a little bit more in depth about the different types of high tunnels and styles and sizes. Thanks, Claudia. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining today. Um, Mara, could we switch to the next slide? So thank you. So I will get into a little bit more detail about some of the uh, shapes and sizes of tunnels and some of the things that uh, you will consider while you're putting together plans for your own tunnels or covered growing structures. And um, here in this slide, um, I just am pointing out uh, one easy first distinction that you might make in shapes of tunnels. There are Gothic shaped or the Quonset shaped. The Gothic kind of like a Gothic cathedral or uh, arches, tall arches, it has a pointed top and uh, that's useful for, um, for our climate or even more northerly climates where snow might accumulate. It needs to be able to fall off the side of the tunnel without uh, collapsing it. Um, and there's also the Quonset shape. Um, that's a rounded shape. It's almost like a, uh, like a semicircle. And, um, you might also consider how long your tunnel is in addition to the shape of the top. How long is it? Um, how many hoops, how many steel ribs are you going to use? How many will fit in your space that will affect the length? There are certain standards uh, when you're buying a kit, for instance, uh, for how much space goes between each rib and how many how many hoops, how many ribs there are in your kit will affect the length of your tunnel. Uh, you might also think about how wide it is. Um, and uh, if you are going to build everything yourself and bend the steel and everything, that will affect some of your calculations for bending. But oftentimes in the kit, they'll tell you exactly how wide your tunnel will be and, what, and you can determine whether or not it will fit in your space. And how tall is another consideration that um, is something that you can take into consideration if you can't build over a certain height or if there are specific plants that you want to grow and you know that you will need to build a trellis that is a certain height, you need to make sure your tunnel is tall enough to accommodate it. Uh, some other things to consider when uh, selecting a kit or designing your high tunnel are the doors and or the end walls on the side. Oftentimes, uh, those don't come included in a kit. You can build them yourself to meet your specific needs. They can be as simple as a piece of 
plastic, hard or soft, that covers the end. Uh, they might be a more, um, a more designed type of door, a sliding door or an opening door. It might just be some plywood or some other kind of covering. Uh, also, ventilation is, an issue, is a concern with high tunnels. We'll get into a little bit more later, but different high tunnel styles have different kinds of vents. Sometimes you just lift up the plastic on the side. Some of them have a more complex system for rolling up the sides to ventilate. And uh, what else? And water, that's another concern. You might, as you are going about your high tunnel uh, design, want to incorporate some kind of a rainwater catchment system. Um, all of those are things that you can design or change or add or not add, depending on the needs of your space and um, and in your budget. That's uh, that's one other thing to consider when selecting a size or shape. Uh, or style of tunnel. Um, all of these different features come with different associated costs and, um, and that your budget might help you uh, decide what it is that your space can accommodate. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So uh, here I've pictured a couple of tunnels. Um, neither of them have uh, the film over the outside, but I think you can still make out the shape. Again, it's a, a Gothic shaped and a Quonset shaped. Um, on the left, the Gothic shaped, the peaked shaped tunnel. That was a tunnel that we constructed uh, in October of 2021. In, additional, in addition to being uh, the farm manager at um, a museum, um, I participated in a uh, high tunnel basics course with farm school. That's how some of my personal um, interest and experience with this got going. And as a part of that course, we constructed a high tunnel at the forest houses um, in the Bronx. This is a 165th street here along the side of the tunnel. And uh, it has a Gothic shape. Um, the, it came from a kit. Uh, so all of the, all of the uh, steel and the plastic and things were included in a kit. Um, it's from farmers friends. And at the end of this presentation, we'll send uh, so a list of some uh, providers, some sellers of kits, if you're interested in going that route. So this one was from Farmer's Friends. It's 14 feet wide. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, it's about 10 feet tall and it's 30 feet long. I think there, I can't remember actually, if this, one, this one's four feet between each of the hoops. And, um, and this one was technically advertised as a caterpillar tunnel. So as you look around, you might see a lot of different uh, like words and terms, uh, high tunnel, hoop house, caterpillar tunnel, uh, like Claudia mentioned. This one was advertised as a caterpillar tunnel. That means it doesn't necessarily have stakes in the ground um, and is, is somewhat temporary, but this is a pretty you know, semi-permanent structure. It has stakes in the ground to keep it secure on the ground. And it cost, um, it cost about $2,000 with the delivery. That's not included, including some of the tools, but to give you a sense of um, what these things cost, this one, that one was about 2000. Um, and it's a pretty, it's a pretty sturdy semi-permanent structure. Uh, on the right is a, another tunnel, a slightly different style. That one is Quonset. And this is one that um, my co-farmers um, and some youth uh, and I built at the at Fiddler Wyckoff uh, Park, where our urban farm is located. This one's a Quonset style. It's rounded. Um, it is ten feet wide, so it's a little bit more narrow. It's seven feet tall, a little bit shorter than the other, and it's it is also thirty feet long. We put five feet between each of the hoops. Um, 
and it, it doesn't currently, but in, um, in about a week, we will put on the uh, plastic around the outside and get going, get going using that tunnel. Um, and that one cost with the delivery of the materials. It also came in a kit, this time from a company called FarmTech. With the delivery of the materials, this one cost $1,400. And um, in addition to size differences, one thing that was different about this tunnel, the Quonset style, was the steel tubing was uh, is three quarter inch diameter. The other tunnel, the Gothic style, was a larger diameter, maybe one inch. And that's something to consider when you're thinking about the durability and the longevity of your tunnel, um, the, the ruggedness of the materials. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So uh, one of the really amazing things about these structures uh, is how uh, variable they can be. Um, we just looked at uh, sort of uh, simple Gothic and Quonset style tunnels. Um, the ones pictured, the one, the tunnel pictured here is one that a, um, a facilitator of that course, uh, uh, he uh, helped to modify that tunnel. And if you look at the shape, you can see it is a uh, Quonset style tunnel, like a semicircle, and it's just been cut in half. So instead of being rounded all the way around, it has one flat wall. And um, these tunnels, if you have the tools or the interest in doing them, they can be modified uh, further to fit your space. Um, even uh, you, you might even put a couple of tunnels next to each other to create uh, even more covered space. You might put them on wheels to move them around your farm. Um, there's, uh, it, there are infinite ways that you can modify or adjust your tunnel to accommodate your space. Um, this, this is just an introduction to get you thinking about what size and shape will be best for you. All right, we can go to the next slide. So as you prepare for um, building your tunnel, one of the things to think about is uh, who is going to be involved in the process. Um, it can be quite an undertaking, um, but don't be daunted. Um, it is something that uh, with a group of people together, you can, you can tackle it no problem. Um, so if you are working in a community garden, some others who might be um, interested in uh, building this tunnel are your fellow gardeners, um, maybe you have neighbors or friends or family who are interested, they might have uh, building interest in building structures or even uh, construction skills or experience. Um, if you work for an organization, um, it might be uh, staff members who are working to build this, build this, or you might be looking for a contractor to put it all together. Um, in the case of the tunnel at Forest Houses, this one pictured here, um, this was a project uh, that a group of students uh, was undertaking. Um, so uh, all of us were our adult students um, and there's about uh, 20 of us. Um, and we had a, uh, some experienced facilitators to help guide the way, um, but together we were able to put this structure together. In the case of the smaller tunnel that we constructed uh, at the uh, Wyckoff House Museum, um, that was that we decided to do with um, some high school students. So though there are some more technical components and building skills you need, I would not discount um, 
high school students and younger from getting some experience uh, from being able to put a, a structure like this together. Um, and uh, that was a group of five of us, six, six of us who put together the uh, smaller structure. So big group, small group, um, you can give some thought to who is going to be involved. Uh, and another reason to give some thought to who this community of involved people is, is that um, high tunnels require a lot of maintenance and upkeep. Um, because they're covered, you will have to consider irrigation needs. Um, over time, there may be rips in the plastic uh, from wind or damage. Uh, you will want to think about the soil fertility, especially if you're growing in the ground. High tunnels are sometimes a place where you grow intensively and that can, um, that can require uh, more attention being paid to the uh, the soil fertility inside the tunnel. You also have a longer season, that's more time growing. And um, you also will want to be thinking about your ventilation in the tunnel. That might mean every day somebody has to be available to lift the sides or open the doors and let some air in. Um, and one other thing that we can send out at the end is a uh, a list of some of the tools in that we used to construct the tunnel, um, or you can reach out to Claudia or myself. Um, but uh, maybe that tool list can give you a little bit, uh, give you an idea of um, what you might need if you are going to construct your tunnel yourself. You can ask other gardeners what tools they have. Just a, a couple to give you an idea, a couple of the big ones include a uh, drills, preferably cordless, a sledgehammer, that's if you're going to put stakes in the ground, and um, an eight-foot ladder that can be very useful for getting to the upper parts of your tunnel. Claudia, I'm handing it back over to you. Well, thanks, Zach. And um, if we can move to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about um, some other things to consider when preparing for a high tunnel. So a common question that we get is about permits or permitting. Um, and as far as I know, New York City doesn't have a definitive policy around high tunnels because as you can imagine, they come in all these different sizes and some are permanent, semi-permanent, not very permanent, but the owner of the property um, your garden is on might have their own permissions and rules to consider. So our suggestions are to ask the leaseholder what the next steps are. Um, it could be owned by an individual, this plot of land, or by an entity like Department of Education or Department of Transportation. Um, as an example, uh, New York City Parks and Green Thumb, they have a set of guidelines that you would need to follow in order to build a high tunnel. And preferably you would just um, contact the outreach coordinator um, before doing anything. Um, but in general, it's really good to just be prepared and have at least these three things in mind. So having a site map of the structure and where you want to put it. This is from Forest Houses in the Bronx that was put together by Green City Force. And they have where, um, I'm not sure if you can see it, but um, they have uh, where the high tunnel is planned to go around some of their very large garden beds. Um, you, as Zach mentioned, might want to have a list of building materials, including the high tunnel specifications. So how big is it gonna be? How wide? Like once you've decided all of that, make sure to have that on hand and a plan for ongoing maintenance. Um, as Zach mentioned, you, will need some hands, especially in inclement weather to um, put the sides down or brush the snow off. Um, so just things to consider. So these things are always good to have um, in planning for a high tunnel. And I think Zach will talk a little bit more about planning and prepping the actual space in the next slide. Yes. Um, so to get a little more into that, uh, preparation of the space. Um, there are um, there are many there are many things you can consider, but 
uh, there are five big um, five big areas of consideration uh, that include the the ground, um, the soil, the orientation of the tunnel, uh, what is your water source, and this one is uh, and a power source. That one's kind of kind of optional. But um, the ground, that includes things like, uh, is the ground level? Where do you have level ground? Um, ideally, um, you want uh, a very, very level surface, less than 5% uh, grade up or down. Um, you also have to consider if anything is below the ground. Um, one thing that uh, we ran into with the forest houses, uh, tunnel as stakes were being put into the ground to secure the structure to the ground. One of the stakes, uh, as it was going in, hit something, maybe some concrete. Um, and so if in your garden or in your space, there's a, it's rocky or there's something down there, that might affect uh, if you can secure the stakes into the ground. Uh, so ground is a one concern. Soil is another one. Um, as with any space in New York City, it's good to test your soil and uh, know uh, what, is, what is in it. Um, I actually spied in the chat, somebody mentioned uh, the landscape fabric. Um, the, that's a great way to, to put a, um, you know, something between the soil and whatever is above the soil. Um, it can also help suppress the weeds that might, the seed that might be in the soil. Um, so soil and ground, those are two. The third is the orientation of the tunnel. Um, at our latitude, uh, ideally it's recommended that your tunnel is oriented with one end east and the other end west. And that just gives the sun as it passes through the sky, it gives the plants inside the most exposure to the sun. Um, but of course, uh, you have to work with the space that you have um, at the, the small tunnel at the Wyckoff House Museum. We oriented that one um, north-south because it fit better in the space that way. And it will still function well as a high tunnel, even with that orientation. Uh, and so the four, a fourth concern is the water source. Um, I'm sure you're always thinking about that in the garden, but um, you also, with your high tunnel, you might have a longer season, um, and that might mean you're interested in doing things before the water gets turned on, and you might be interested in continuing to do things and able to with your high tunnel until after the water has been turned off. Uh, so uh, the water source is important to, cons uh, to consider. Um, as you prepare for your tunnel. Finally, a power source is, a, is um, something to think about. Um, although the high tunnels are uh, intended to be passive structures, uh, you might put on some fans or something to increase the ventilation, uh, or maybe in the building process, um, you need power for a drill or something. So. Uh, where you're getting your power from is a fifth concern. Um, let's see, and uh, just briefly, a couple of the more um, day of or week of considerations um, as you prepare for your tunnel. Um, if you're ordering a kit, uh, ask uh, who is going to receive the kit uh, when it's delivered. Um, in the case of uh, the tunnels I've worked on, everything has come on a shipping pallet and it was delivered on a big truck um, and somebody had to be available um, to receive the delivery um, and that required some, that requires some coordinating. You might also need to store those materials somewhere um, until you're ready to build. So that's kind of like a week of, week of, your, of your build consideration. Um, make sure that the site is clear and you're ready to work. Um, tools also, do you have the tools? Is there somewhere safe or secure to store them while you're uh, working on this project? 
and um, also for the day of, you know, check out the weather. Um, wind is one of the hardest things to deal with as you are working on a project like this. Um, uh, and finally, um, food, water, shelter as you're working. This is like a whole day or multi-day project. So uh, it's great to have snacks and water and a place to rest and, um, and plan out what you're doing. Okay, Claudia, over to you. Thanks, Zach. And we can move to the next slide, please. Um, so lastly, how are you gonna pay for all of this? Um, now you have a little bit of an idea of what you might need to pay for. So the materials, the actual cost of the high tunnel, maybe some tools, um, labor, if you're going to hire a contractor or pay your community members to build this high tunnel. Um, so you might need a couple thousand dollars, if not more. Um, some of the things that you can do are crowdfunding. Sadly, I missed the IOB presentation earlier this week. Um, but you can use sites like that or Fundly or um, other small grants available through nonprofits. Um, a lot of them are local too. Um, you can also apply for a program through USDA NRCS. And NRCS stands for Natural Resources Conservation Service. So they provide financial assistance for certain conservation practices um, and high tunnels is one of them. Uh, they have two programs, uh, AMA and EQUIP that you see here on the screen. Um, there are some basic eligibility requirements that you'd have to meet, um, such as you'd have to grow in that space for at least a year. Um, the site has to be a part of an organization. So uh, in other words, no backyard gardeners, it'd have to be like a community space. Um, and you'd have to show some kind of proof that you can grow on that land. So you'd have to get either permission from um, the landowner or um, involve them in that way. But once you meet those basic eligibility requirements, you would basically contact the local um, NRCS district conservationist. For this area, it's Liz Camps, who is based in Long Island. Um, Liz would come out to your site for a site assessment, um, talk about the different, um, talk about a conservation plan. In other words, other than a high tunnel, like what other things could your site be eligible for, um, such as cover crops or um, mulching. So a few things that they can look out for um, to try and increase the amount that you would be reimbursed for. Um, but one very important thing is that uh, you would have to use a kit. So you would have to purchase a high tunnel that is, um, comes in a kit. You would not be able to do a do-it-yourself kind of high tunnel. Um, they have um, more specific requirements around structural support and spacing. And they would definitely walk you through all of this, um, but just, be aware of that ahead of time. Um, and the next slide, which is actually our final slide. Um, thank you all so much. We're so excited to answer your questions now. Our contact information is here. We'll also be emailing a PDF copy of all of these slides that have links, um, I think, at some point um, at the end of the workshop. Hi, I'm gonna be doing the Q&A for today. We have quite a few questions. Um, one of the first ones that was asked was, what happens to the high tunnels on very windy days? I can take that one. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I uh, ideally, as you uh, are uh, designing or picking a tunnel, you are going to uh, pick one that can sustain, that can 
um, stand up in the wind. Um, putting the sides down might help. Uh, closing doors, securing loose flaps and things is important so that they don't catch the wind and blow away. Um, one big way that the tunnel can be damaged is if uh, the wind gets into the tunnel and blows the plastic off of it. Um, I think that is, in my experience, that has been a bigger concern than the wind pressing down on the outside and blowing the tunnel over. Um, it's kind of like a bed sheet. You don't want it to get in there and blow the whole thing out from the inside. Um, but a lot of these structures, uh, especially in the kits, they're designed to be quite uh, sturdy. And if you put them together as um, as uh, instructed, they are um, very secure. In the case that a high tunnel does get damaged, um, are there replacement parts available? I'm happy to take that. Um, yes, there are replacement parts available. Typically, you can just contact the manufacturer and um, they are, from what I've heard, most of these uh, manufacturers are really good about talking you through the steps, but also providing technical support afterwards and like basically for the life of the tunnel. Um, so you can order replacement parts. Um, you can also find them on like Johnny's Seeds and places like that. Um, a couple of things, you know, like the plastic eventually will wear down after about maybe five, seven years. Um, so that's something that will be replaced. But um, like Zach said, it's just best to keep on top of um, maintenance instead of letting it get to, to the worst. So if there's a little rip, you, you know, just cover it with, um, just uh, repair the rip and just kind of stay on top of it in that, in that way. But high tunnels can last you a really long time, like 20 years. Thank you. Do you know if any of the available funding for kit reimbursement might also be accessible for if you need to reorder any parts for maintenance? As far as I know, the, the NRCS grant, for example, wouldn't cover replacement parts. You'd have to do that um, on your own, but you could possibly use like these other methods, like a small grant or something like that to, to buy replacement parts. Awesome. Um, you talked about orientation of the high tunnel a little bit, but can you just clarify, does the tunnel have to be in the sun? Can it be under something like a tree shadow or where there isn't much sun exposure? Um, it, when, when we're working here in the city, we have to use the space that is available to us. And if uh, it is partly covered by a tree, that's okay. Um, Ideally, uh, you have a nice open area where the tunnel can get full sun exposure all day long. But um, you know, even if it is partly covered by a tree, as a structure that's somewhat or entirely enclosed, it will, even with part sun, heat up inside more than to a higher temperature than outside the tunnel. And if the temperature um, the warmth is really what you are uh, going for in there, maybe with starting seeds or something like that, then uh, it still will be very functional, even if a tree is creating partial shade inside the tunnel. Thank you. Um, someone asked, is it possible to have an exit in the middle of the tunnel? Um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't personally have any experience with that, but uh, just in, in seeing around the city, some of the different um, covered structures that folks have built in, in community gardens or on urban farms, um, if you sit down and do a little design work, I don't see why you couldn't, uh, you couldn't design one that uh, does have an exit in the middle of the tunnel. Um, I haven't seen any kits available that include a exit in the middle of the tunnel, but most of the kits are just an assembly of common construction materials that you can find at 
a Home Depot or something like that, or a hardware store. So if you're going to modify your tunnel to have a entrance or exit in the middle, you can probably find the materials to do it um, at the hardware store. Cool. Um, someone else asked, in a cold frame, is there a way to automate venting so that it does not get too hot? Uh, I actually don't know the answer to that, but, um, well, maybe I'll let Zach answer if you have an answer to that. Um, I, uh, with a cold frame, I've all, I've personally thought of cold frames as being like uh, something that you you barely have to you barely have to touch. It just kind of uh, will warm up on its own. Um, but um, you could probably put a little sensor and some kind of a motor in it, some more uh, some greenhouses and structures that are a little bit more. Um, technically, uh, technologically advanced have those, those sorts of abilities. And maybe you could do it on a small scale in a cold frame. Um, it's uh, just whatever you're able to do or design. Yeah, let us that. know. Oh, gardeners, let us know in the chat if you have automated cold frames. I, I can answer that question when I have my uh, session. Perfect. Awesome. Cool. Um, on that note of ventilation, will the heat created inside the high tunnel um, create condensation that might lead to mold or any other problems like that? Uh, I can get it started and I'll pass it on to you. You probably have more experience doing that. Um, but yes, that's something to consider. So ventilation um, at any time of year really uh, is something to keep an eye on. That's why we mentioned having to, um, having enough help on hand to go and lift the sides of the, of the tunnel um, in order to create that ventilation because that could be an issue. Someone, sorry, Zach, did you have anything to add to that? Um, I was just going to add that another thing uh, that I, I've experienced is it can get very dry inside of the tunnel too, without um, the soil being uh, wet by the rain. So um, yes, you, you'll have to keep an eye on those things, uh, too humid or too dry. Great, thank you. Someone was also wondering, would a tunnel high or low tend to attract any rodents or pests? That is possible. We do live um, in an area where we have pests, uh, rodents. So uh, in case you don't know, during the colder months, they like to seek shelter in warmer places. Um, so anything from a compost pile to a high tunnel, it's possible that you might um, get some rodents. I think, uh, just from talking to people around the city who have high tunnels, um, they tend to have issues with like cats getting in or raccoons. And so they, um, if, the, if the sides are open, they put a kind of barrier so that um, it detracts larger animals to, to go in there and feel warm during the winters. But is there anything else you wanted to add to that? Um, I would just add that uh, sometimes a high tunnel can become like your main storage place <laughs> because it's so cool. It's like nice in there and spacious, more so than your shed. But um, with uh, rodents, sometimes things sitting around for a long time undisturbed, uh, that's what they're attracted to. So uh, keeping the tunnel tidy and um, uh, open and moving things around and using them is, uh, you know, one thing that you can do to, to prevent, prevent rats from uh, making a home. That's really great advice. Thank you. 
Could you, um, either of you elaborate on some of the benefits of a high tunnel versus a greenhouse or just maybe compare and contrast uh, when you would choose one over the other? Yeah, um, what we generally think of a greenhouse as something that's more permanent, it's more high tech, um, it's covered in a polycarbonate plastic, which is a hard clear plastic or glass, and that's more expensive to source these materials. Um, I think two greenhouses are, are generally used for propagation. So um, the attention to heat and light is very sensitive. So that's why they have um, sometimes automated functions like lighting and fans and, and um, use an energy source for heat. Um, so they tend to be just like on the spectrum of more expensive, more high tech and more permanent. High tunnels are uh, less permanent, less high tech. You know, you could build it yourself. You can even do like a DIY kind of thing, um, sourcing these different materials. Zach, do you want to add anything or did Claudia get it? Cool. Um, Someone asked, do you know a local company that can help with greenhouse fan repair? I, I don't uh, personally, but when we've had uh, like lawnmower issues here, there's an auto shop. Uh, we happen to be near um, a lot of auto repair shops and they've helped us with some small motor repair issues. Um, so I, I can't recommend a specific place, but maybe some other some other engine or motor shops might be able to to help. That's great. Thank you so much. It looks like we were able to answer everyone's questions. Thank you so much to everyone um, who uh, asked a question in the chat. Mara's going to jump back in, and we're going to get into our next webinar. Thanks so much. Thank you so much to Claudia and Zach. Y'all are amazing. Thank you for sharing so much wonderful information. Um, we have a second part to the session, so please um, stick with us. I'm excited to introduce a community gardener who has been kind of tinkering with DIY designs in his garden. Um, and so, Vipin, if you're ready to join us, I would like to introduce you. Yes. Okay, great. I'm gonna add you to the spotlight. Wonderful. Um, so Vipin Barathan is a community gardener who has contributed to Liz Christie Garden, Sixth Street Botanical Garden, and West 123rd Street Community Garden. Thank you so much, Vipin, you have mic. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm getting a four minutes. I'm looking at my timer there. Um, yes, you're getting an extra four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, will I, will I be able to use those four minutes is the real question, right? Uh, so they went high, I'm going low. So this is, this is my... Um, piece here, you know, it's, it's in contrast to the, uh, to those high tunnels, which require a lot of community participation, which require a lot of money, and which require a lot of land, I'm going to talk about, uh, specifically about low tunnels. And uh, let me start by sharing my screen. And of course, before I start, I have to thank Claudia and Zach for setting up the uh, conversation. And of course, the parks department and Green Thumb in particular for uh, organizing this webinar series, this conference really, uh, which covers a lot of ground and uh, let me start by sharing my screen and uh, some of my stuff is very low tech. So you have to 
pardon, uh, you know, the kind of uh, building that I've done. Uh, so let me start sharing my screen. Here, here it is. Can, I, uh, can people see it? I have to go into presentation mode, I think. Yeah, it looks uh, good. And if you start the uh, slideshow, I'll let you know. Yeah, it's, it, I'm doing this on a laptop, so everything is hidden because, <laughs> anyway, so here we go. You can see this uh, the slides properly, I hope. Yes, it looks perfect. Uh, so, Chase away your winter blues by growing greens. That is a topic. And in the background, what you see is what I've grown. And the photo was taken two days ago. So you can imagine that these greens have not only uh, grown there, but inside my uh, low tunnel. Well, I don't call it a low tunnel. I'll get into that why. And uh, um, you know, I'm able to also harvest some of that microgreens. And so I'll, I'll show you a bowl of harvested microgreens that I consumed two days ago. Um, so how did it, you know, this is the agenda. Um, uh, what is, uh, what are we talking about here? Crop protection, design of a, hybrid tunnel coal frame. That's, that's what I have created. And uh, what should be grown, and that will be the, most of the talk will be about the design, about the materials that you need, about the actual process of constructing such a, uh, such a hybrid tunnel coal frame. And of course, with, with, uh, the plants that you're going to grow, watering, overheating, which we already spoke about a little bit uh, in the uh, in the previous uh, presentation. Then you know some words on the future, like portability, uh, reuse, and so on, and a and a single reference. Um, where are we? We are in New York City, right? 40.76 degrees north, which is our latitude, which determines the amount of sunlight we receive uh, through the year. The, you know, it varies, of course. We are also in zone 7A uh, of the US, USDA hardness zone. My aim is not to fight where we are, but to use what we have, which is sunlight, more than the south of France. People don't even realize that south of France is probably 42 uh, degrees north, 41 or 42. Uh, we are the same latitude as Madrid. So when we say Madrid, people think of, um, heat and summers. So even though we share the uh, latitude with Madrid, what is our main problem? The main problem uh, in terms of climate, why are we so cold here? Because of ocean currents, because of the Arctic air that comes from Canada, uh, we are much colder than Madrid, but we have something that they have, which is sunlight. Uh, more sunlight than most places, um, you know, to the north in Europe, for example, Norway or, uh, you know, places closest, closer to the Arctic Circle. So sunlight is what we have. And uh, crop protection is an old idea as Claudia mentioned you know, it started with the Romans, but, you know, it probably goes back even further 
we don't have anything that survives, but most likely people used some form of uh, crop protection, which means select the right crops, not tomatoes in winter, winter not eggplant, not okra, not <laughs> things like that, because uh, they are not going to survive inside a passive uh, a hybrid cold frame tunnel. The second point, wind is more destructive than the cold. Actually, it sucks everything out of the plants. Even if you select the right plants that can survive the winter, you know, as we'll go into the plant list later, you can see that. Um, the main, main feature of this is there is no active heating needed. I did create a, let's say a hot box, maybe 20 years ago, where I dug down and put raw horse manure in the ground, and then I covered it back up. Then I put a cold frame on top of it with an automatic opener, which I'll talk about uh, also. So here the heat is generated by the uh, rotting of the horse manure. But what I'm going to talk about here is not about uh, you know, a heated space at all. So as uh, I had mentioned, you know, I'm probably repeating this, we have more sunlight than the south of France and same latitude as Madrid. So the idea is to extend the harvest season. These ideas have been taken from Elliot Coleman, um, who created a farm for small scale market gardening. And he was able to grow uh, crops through the year in Northern Maine. Okay, so he, was, he, he discusses, uh, you know, lots of different techniques to do this, most of them passive in the sense that you're not going to provide outside heat. Uh, but, you know, obviously when you are doing a market garden on on five acres, the scale is completely different. He does talk about uh, high tunnels uh, and various other ways of moving tunnels. He had a um, kind of a sled design where you could actually pull the high tunnel from one place to the next place because especially during the fall and the spring, some plants can survive uh, in, even with the colder weather. Uh, so in the spring, you want those plants to be open to the air and then you wanna move the uh, tunnel on skids to another spot usually adjacent because these tunnels are, are huge, meaning they'll probably need a couple of people to pull the whole thing. Um, but in the second spot, he grew tomatoes in, let's say beginning of March, he started the seeds in Northern Maine uh, and he was able to, uh, grow tomatoes and have them ready by early spring. So what are the ideas here? You can uh, grow the crops under cover, of course, cold frame, which we have already uh, seen what a cold frame is. It's a box with a lid that is transparent either an old window frame that you get from the trash or 
you make something with the plexiglass, but it's rigid in the sense that if snow falls on it, 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 it won't collapse. So that's, that's the great thing about a cold frame. But the cold frame does have its, its challenges. One of them is the weight, because it is made of hard material and uh, with glass and everything else, it gets very difficult to move it around and to store it. And it's also rigid. And of course, we have seen the low and the high tunnels in the previous presentation. So what is my context is to use the eight by four garden beds in the garden. The garden is on this block um, right down the street from me, which is very important as you'll see later. Um, it has about 20 boxes. It's in central Harlem. So we have other, you know, many challenges, including people jumping into the garden to do their business, whatever. So, uh, and the rats of course is a, are a big problem, but we keep them at bay by just using traps, not poisons. And uh, so we have eight by four garden beds. We want to create protection with the minimum disruption. That means none of those garden boxes, or I mean, actually they are boxes eight by four. Uh, they all belong to different people. We cannot move them around easily because they are filled with earth. So minimum disruption is the key there. Uh, the philosophy was to use readily available materials uh, and to provide stability and integrity for snow. Easy to move and put up, collapse for storage, easy to release, for, meaning you can roll, roll, roll back the top for watering and tending and harvesting. So this is the design I came up with. So there's an eight by four garden bed with what I call basically sleepers. Sleepers are these two by fours that are laid flat and they are in pieces like all around. And these blue circles are this um, bolts that I put into those sleepers um, and they stick up out of the, out of the uh, sleepers. And why sleepers? Because I don't wanna to touch the garden bed uh, structure at all. I want the sleeper to be separate. So some of the nice features about the sleepers is that because they are just lying on the ground, they are not, fastened to anything. Uh, and because this sleeper, for example, is laid over these two, so you have a small gap under, underneath the sleeper, which uh, allows for a little bit of airflow. I can also lift up that whole frame because this, these sleepers are uh, fastened together with screws which I don't show in the diagram, unfortunately, but I can lift up the whole thing and prop it up. And, you know, before I go further, these bolts are basically made of steel because I don't want them to rust and they are six inches long. So for a two by four, that means they stick up probably around four and a half inches, um, a six inch bolt was, you know, come up about, about four and a half inches off the sleeper. Now we will see how these bolts are used 
to create a uh, anchoring point for the hoops that we're going to put on these. So in the next slide, I have a materials list. You know, I already talked about the uh, steel balls. Then I, I use rubber washers, which I'll demonstrate in a moment why I need the rubber washers. And then the sleepers, which are two by four lumber, eight foot, three pieces. And then comes the hoops, which I made out of leftover PEX tubing, uh, not plastic, you know, not a, um, not a store-bought item, but some, something that I repurpose from uh, various uh, projects that I have in my house. And also you can buy them uh, for not that much money. So basically they are half inch. So you see the bowls are three eight and the tubing is half inch. So they, if they fit on top of the bowls, they're gonna be very loose, right? Uh, there's a, a eighth of an inch uh, gap. And I did this deliberately, right? And I'll show you why. And then you have plastic sheets, 14 by eight, two of them. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the, I, I don't have my phone here, so I, I, can, I don't know what time it is. I have to probably- uh, You it. have 15 minutes left and we wanna save some of that time for questions. Yes, so let me go ahead and go into a little more detail on this construction. Uh, so this is a, this is how the, I've taken a video of how I'm putting on a, uh, one end of the PEX tubing on these bolts. If you notice, it is a washer slipped over the bolt about an inch from the bottom and then I do a pressure fit. So if you, if you look carefully, you'll see, I also ream out that PEX tubing with a half inch uh, drill bit so that it's a little expanded. Once you start cutting those PEX, sometimes they constrict a little bit. So you have to deburr it, you have to, anyway, you get the idea. You slip the, the whole thing over and just, push it fast so that, so that there is a compression fit. Uh, anyway, that is the way the PEX is fastened to the sleeper. And this is just a description of the process. What, what is, you know, what exactly do you need to do to construct this? Uh, the, the, frame, which is rigid because it has, if you notice, uh, it has not only the hoops going this way, but it also has from head to tail um, uh, hoops going head to tail. So you have a, basically a grid uh, with, with that structure. And I'll show you the so this is how it looks. It's very low tech, as you can imagine. And I'm just putting, uh, fastening it all down with stones, bricks, uh, just to keep the sheets from flapping. And as you can imagine, um, this has got two layers, one uh, thinner plastic down and thicker on top. And this is the hoop in the snow. Snow as, you know, I think it was in January, there was a pretty uh, heavy snowfall and the system held, but it buckles in places because it is made of packs. It's not a uh, completely rigid system. So what happens is it 
is strong because it gives way. It, it, is, it is the principle of yielding before the force instead of just collapsing because it's made of rigid materials. Uh, so this is the uh, snow. And this is just that day I took off the um, top and I got, uh, you know, I was looking at my plants and uh, that's a mescaline mix. And here you can see the frame that has been strengthened also by fastening the, uh, the transfers and the, uh, and the other members together using plastic ties. But I really think I should have been using jute, uh, sisal fiber, because it's much more um, forgiving and plastic has a tendency to slip. So I changed those blue plastic ties. And this is what I got uh, from the microgreens on February 18th, 2022, and uh, I ate those greens. So some of the problems with, with uh, what I did was to do more with the fact it was experimental and I had to um, find out and learn things by doing them. Uh, and of course I make mistakes, which is fine. Uh, I accept those mistakes and sometimes I even use those mistakes to make it strong, you know, make the thing stronger. Like for example, the plastic ties. Uh, so how are we doing on time here? Is it, do, I, do I have some more? Uh, we have 10 minutes left and we want to save some time for questions as well. So Okay, so, so I'm going to just rush through the rest. I've already said what I have to say. Uh, and I have these, uh, you know, choice of crops. And I have long plant lists, but I'm using only two or three things. One is mescaline, which is of course a mixture, mixture of various things. Then I also planted Swiss chard, which didn't come up that well because I planted it too late. And right now I'm doing some succession with um, parsley and uh, garlic. Uh, two challenges, watering and temperature control. I, I have a max min uh, thermometer and this is the temperature in the cold frame on the day with that heavy snow. And as you can see, the maximum temperature went up to 36. I think outside temperature was something like 15 or even lower. So some of my problems, you know, uh, that I'm trying to deal with. Uh, so I'm going to move the frame to another box, try some succession planting and heat control, which I said I will uh, deal with. And this is what I use. It is, a, uh, I mean, I used in my cold frame before. This is an automatic opener made by the Norwegians or, or the Danish. And, and it has a, a piston which opens uh, by the heat inside the cold frame. I mean, inside the frame. But I don't know how I'm going to attach it to this sleeper system. Uh, I still haven't figured that out, but I'm going to do it somehow. Anyway. So I'm now ready for questions. Thank you so much for that, Vipin. We have some questions from the chat that I'm gonna start reading to you. Um, one of the first questions was, what temperature do you estimate can be achieved within a low tunnel in the middle of the winter? Temperature doesn't really matter that much because most of these plants are cold hardy to 20 degrees. It is never going to go, you know, the lowest I've seen inside were 19 degrees Fahrenheit but it didn't kill the, the plants. What killed them though was 
uh, our enthusiasm to water, uh, we tried to put some snow in there and that was not good uh, because the plants, if they are hardened outside, they probably can survive under the, under the snow. In fact, snow is good because it gives a cover. So in terms of the temperature differences, the lowest I've seen is 19 degrees, but the highest I've seen is 75 degrees. So the temperature does go up quite a bit. In the winter time, it's probably okay. But if it's going to grow above 100 degrees, these plants are going to die. So that's, you know, that's for later in the spring. Anyway. Thank you. Um, what specific materials are used to cover the tunnel to allow the best quality of sunlight? Well, you know, I repurposed what I had. I had some drop cloths lying around, which, <laughs> which I washed and just used them. I'm not so concerned about, you know, the UV rating, the thickness. They all, you know, if you're doing, if you're putting in 2000 bucks into a high tunnel, you probably should consider all those things. But here, you know, this is all like, using stuff that's lying around. Great, I'm sure people will appreciate that. Um, maybe just some trial and error at home. Um, do you have any ideas on how to stabilize the floor or the soil surface of a hot frame, um, specifically to get the heating process to be more efficient? Well, The heating is not the most important thing. The two things we mentioned are one is the uh, one is the fact that you're keeping the whole thing up clear of snow. Second, the protection from the wind. Uh, the warmth is definitely helps. Uh, I should have started my seeds um, probably later in the you know like early fall, that way those plants would have been much bigger and they would be able to withstand really low temperatures. Uh, soil surface, it was basically a new box that I built. So I had just put in the soil into that box and let it settle for a couple of, you know, couple of weeks before I built this whole thing. Thank you. How long did it take you to grow the microgreens from seed to harvest? Well, I was uh, foolish, right? Because I planted the seeds on December 26th, which is actually too, too late. Uh, I was more concerned about the mechanics of how to create this. And I was thinking about it. Uh, next year, you know, I'll, I'll start it earlier. Uh, the answer is it took me two months, but it's during the coldest months of the year, mm -hmm. right? And they, I still have plenty of greens in there, which are going to explode because as you know, the leaves grow exponentially. When they are very small, they're they grow slowly, but when they get to a certain size, they start, you know, it's a non-linear takeoff. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have uh, greens for the next month or month and a half. That's great. Uh, how much earlier do you think you'll start the seeds next year? Probably um, early fall and I will not protect them till they need to be protected. Mm -hmm. So they, I, I would let them grow. And the other thing I didn't, um, that I was foolish about was sowing it thickly uh, and not thinking about how much, you know, space there is between plants. So I just start clipping the microgreens and the act of thinning actually gives me microgreens. 
So that that's the way I approach it. Everything is about uh, do nothing, right? I mean, this is uh, I'm a great I'm a follower of Fukuoka, if you know what I mean. Do you have any interest in collaborating with other community gardeners? Yes. Um, once I get get this going and demonstrate to people that this can be done, uh, I can, you know, people have already approached me in the garden. We have about 20, 20 members, I would say, uh, and, you know, about 20, 15 boxes. So. And I, uh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. And I think that uh, for the hydronal uh, stuff, with the restaurants having those COVID huts, I've been eyeing them. Maybe even COVID goes away, we get some transparent uh, uh, huts all pre-built and just bring it to the garden. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, the coffee shop across the street from my house just turned theirs into a greenhouse. So it's definitely a thing that can happen. Um, someone in the chat is just saying that they're also, um, they live on the Upper West Side and they would be interested in sharing ideas. So maybe you could uh, provide your email address or some sort of contact information to the participants to um, keep it. Yeah, time. yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, I mean, I can just uh, share it right now. Great. It's, it's uh, VIP at uh, dlt.nyc. DLT.nyc? Yeah, DLT, not uh, VIP.nyc, but DLT. Oh, Mara also shared it. Great. <laughs> um, were there any design ideas that you have tried that really didn't work that you would not recommend? I don't know. I mean, you know, I tried to... <laughs> I haven't, you know, I haven't been doing this long enough because I took a long break. I raised two kids. So now I'm more into this than before. So hopefully I learned something from my mistakes and keep going or use my mistakes. Great. Thank you so much, Vipin. I think we're going to pass it back to Mara to close us out for today.